Welcome to the Empathic Mastery Show. I'm your host, Jennifer Moore, and I'm so glad you're here. This is a place where we talk about what it means to be highly sensitive and empathic, how this impacts all aspects of our lives, and we explore tools, resources, and solutions so we can shift from absorbing all the thoughts, feelings, and energy of the world around us to being beacons for calm, love, and healing. Hey there, everybody. So today I have a really delicious conversation with Tracy Hill, who is also known as Samaya. And we're going to be talking about the impact of being highly sensitive and empathic on our health, on our relationships, on all kinds of amazing stuff. Tracy Hill, also known as Samaya, provides the space for people to take back their emotional, mental, and physical health through subtle energy alchemy, understanding how to overcome emotional trauma, and how to finally follow your passion and purpose. No stranger to adversity and hard work, Tracy uses her professional and personal experience to help others live their best lives and equips them to handle whatever life brings them. So, Samaya, Tracy, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Jennifer. It's so great to be here. I'm excited for this chat we're going to have. <laughs> Me too. And so before we jumped on to the podcast, we were just talking about, you know, the fact that you didn't necessarily have the word empath when you were really little, but you did know that you were different. So I'd love to start with that very beginning story about what was it like for you as a highly sensitive kid? Like, did you know you were highly sensitive? Like, tell me about your childhood or tell us about your childhood. Tell us about that original, those original experiences. Sure. Um, so I grew up with a brother who's younger and, you know, we, we grew up in an area that there weren't a ton of kids at the time. But I, you know, my mom is a very social person and I was always incredibly shy. I really not want to talk um, because, and of course, I had no words to put to this, nor did I have anyone to help me understand what was happening. But from a very young age, I can remember feeling, feeling the energy of people, the emotions of people and it didn't scare me, but it was so much coming at me that it would kind of put me in, in like a deer in headlights mm -hmm. where I didn't know how to react to people. And of course, I never talked about this. I just kept it all inside. And there were instances that I can remember, like my grandmother, my mom's mom, we'd be at her house a lot. We were very close. and. Her house was kind of haunted and, mm -hmm. you know, the faucets would turn on and the basement was, ugh. but I, they didn't really talk about it. The adults didn't talk about it, but I felt all of it. And I had so many deja vu's when I was there. And so I could feel the energy of the house and I was terrified of that basement. And mm -hmm. so I knew I was different. You know, I knew that there was something definitely different about me. And, and uh, out of curiosity, where was this? What part of? Um, in Chicago, um, by Midway Airport. So, okay, you know the yep. listeners are familiar, but uh, kind of on the south side. Yeah, yeah, you know, northern Midwest, Chicago yes. area. Awesome, Chicago area. Yeah, yeah, just just to get orientation. Just yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, even through school, you know, I had a, I was again, I was really shy. And it was not because I didn't want friends. It was because I didn't know how to manage all the emotions I was feeling. And again, I, you know, if you had asked me then, there's no way I could even explain how mm -hmm. I was feeling. But it even got to the point where there's, and it still happens to today, but I understand it, where I would be so connected to somebody because maybe it was a past life, past life connection or some other kind of cord connection that I would take on everything. And it was like, all of a sudden, I'd get all these visions of things that they're not my visions. 
and I would completely feel and know everything that they're experiencing or have experienced. I wasn't sure, but I was getting visions that weren't mine. Yes. And um, it would almost make me want to pass out mm. because it was, it was very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And um, I really, I stayed shy until I became a very, um, a teenager. Yes. <laughs> 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 I started, you know, rebelling and, and that kind of stuff. And I was rebelling, I think, because I was trying to quiet the noise in, in my head. Right. Well, and and I mean, I'm imagining, uh, even though you haven't, you you know, code, re rebelling often is code for, I tried, you know, drugs and alcohol and, you know, like sex, drugs and rock and roll. I'm wondering if drugs or alcohol were part of that rebellion. Yes, no, or um, no, actually, no? no, they weren't. But you know, I, I feel like though I'm trying to think, like I did black out some of my like 13, mm -hmm. 14 year old self, um, because I just I was not comfortable in my own skin. Yeah, so yeah, was yeah, really uncomfortable, awkward, and not because of how I, not so much how I looked. I just didn't know what was happening. I didn't know who I was. I was confused and ugh. Well, I mean, how are you going to be able to distinguish, like, if you are getting so much information from the outside world and you're experiencing it as if, as if it is your own and you don't have any vocabulary for it and it makes you feel like you're going to pass out, then, I mean, how are you going to know yourself? Because it's like, what's yours, what's not yours? It makes total sense that at that age, you would have been just completely confused. And I just have to say... I'm really impressed that you didn't necessarily turn to drugs and alcohol at that age because so many of us like are so incredibly uncomfortable that when we find the substance and it brings us that feeling of relief, it's like, well, of course you're going to go down that path because it alleviates the shyness. It alleviates the, it, it turns down the noise. So I'm curious actually, like what was in terms of your rebellion, what were the things that allowed you to turn the noise down a bit? Um, I actually really dove into dancing. And because I think that there's music. Yes. And then it's, while it's group, but it's still individual. Right? Yes. So I was able to really dive deep into just sucking my life into dance. Mm -hmm. and that's all I did, uh, you know, dance, 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 because there was music and there was like, I was good at it. So it was just like an addiction. It's like addiction, like anything else. It was just like, all right, found my thing. Let me dive straight into it. Um, but it then in my twenties though, because I was still, again, I, and I can tell the story too, but I didn't know still what I was doing. Like I really didn't understand that what an empath was. Mm -hmm. And so alcohol then became a thing in my early 20s. And that was the reason was to shut off my head. Yes. <laughs> like, shut up. <laughs> yes. And like, I don't want to feel, I just, you know, let me be numb. Yes, absolutely. Well, and, you know, going back to the dancing you know, dancing and exercise are one of those things that you can do pretty obsessively and pretty addictively and still get a lot of strokes for it because it's exercise and it's good for you. And you're, you know, and dancing, like going to dance rehearsal and dancing like four or five hours a day or even two, three hours a day is still like, look at her. She's so disciplined. She's doing such a wonderful thing that I think that it can easily, like you can really get into it without necessarily any of the sort of social concern that some of the other behaviors, like people are like, are you sure you want to do that? And whereas if you're dancing, nobody's saying, are you sure you want to do that? Everybody's like, look, Tracy's dancing. Isn't that amazing? So I, I can right. sort of imagine like there was probably a long period where it may have been addictive for you, but I don't imagine you were getting a lot of feedback from anybody else saying, hey, you're on the wrong track or you're on the wrong path. Not at, yeah, not at all. It's exactly like you said, like, oh, look at, she's dancing. She's yeah. dancing some more. And I didn't even see it as a problem then. I, you know, yeah. I didn't really, 
I don't, all this is in hindsight, of course, mm-hmm. but I will tell you, this is kind of jumping my timeline, timeline, but it's appropriate. We in my early, I know I'm too smart yeah. audience. Like, yeah. <laughs> in my early twenties, when I was finishing up my master's degree, I was working out and your audience, your listeners and be like, no way, but it, this is not smart. I was working out at six to eight hours a day. Oh my God. Because I was ignored. I just didn't want to feel, I guess, you know, now in hindsight. Um, and that's when I got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis too, mm. because I didn't want to feel right. So guess what happened? The whole left side of my body went numb. And mm. So, mm. Hmm. Well, there you go. And now you're not feeling. Right. Right. <laughs> not what I meant, but okay. <laughs> and the left side of the body is the receiving side of the body. So you literally like shut down the entire receptive channel. That's a good point. Yes, I did not think of that. It was so it was the right side of my brain that had the lesions and the right. left side was affected. So yeah, I just, my body is like, I'll show you a universe. I'll show you. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're, yeah, we're like, we're like, yeah, no, we're not going to do any more of this anymore. Wow. So don't work out that much because <laughs> it's mm-hmm, not mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just, Well, and you were saying, you know, um, we were talking before we had gotten onto the recording about just how being highly said, you know, I've I've interviewed a lot of people where they talk about suppressing their intuitive abilities, suppressing their empathic gifts, trying to control it, trying to stop it. And a lot of times it shows up as like, I've I've met a lot of people where it shows up as um, mental health issues, anxiety disorders, and also as um, eating, like it shows up with weight that a lot of times suppressing the empathic abilities turns into excessive weight on the body. But, you know, and then also I've certainly met people and talked to people about when it really starts to impact our health. I, what I love about this conversation with you and I is talking about, you know, trying to suppress it doesn't necessarily just mean that you have a bad day or that you're dealing with a little bit of anxiety or even being a few pounds or, you know, many pounds overweight. It can really, really mess with your system. And so I love the fact that you can see the correlation between I don't want to feel this. And so your body just basically was like, okay, you don't want to feel this. Let's just shut it all down. Yep. It was like, yeah. you know, subconsciously said, mm, it's too much for me to handle. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, I was, I was overwhelming myself, overstressing myself because I didn't want to deal with all the feelings <laughs> of whose I didn't know and you know, just, oh, it's too much. <laughs> and, you know, innately, oh, I think by, by nature, I'm a people person. Mm-hmm. But because I didn't understand how to work with my empathy, my empathic abilities, I just was like, am I a people person? Or am I not? Am I like, do I want to make friends? Do I want to hide in the a tent all day? <laughs> you know? It's like, I have no idea. And then you get frustrated because you have no idea who you are and oh who that frustration is is real oh it really it real. really is and that doubt and that confusion i was really grateful when i learned the term ambivert because i could never ever relate like when i took the myers briggs i landed smack dab in the middle between e and i like i really am an ambivert which is basically not an extrovert not an introvert because i had always felt like the sort of the binary nature of like, are you an introvert or an extrovert? I couldn't, I just couldn't land in either of those categories. And it sounds like that was similar for you where I'm glad you said that. I didn't have never heard that term. before. Isn't it a great term? Yeah. Yeah, Congratulations. Welcome. (laughs) Welcome to the ambivert world. I'm married to another ambivert too. And it's like, it's it's like, you know, we get in some ways we get the best of both worlds, but in other times we get the worst of both worlds. You know what it's like? It's like when a friend says, hey, you want to go, you know, look, we're going here tonight and the plans sound awesome. But then it comes to that night and you're like, no, no, yeah, no. <laughs> I'm going to stay home. <laughs> I'm gonna Sorry, I got to cancel. Home. Yeah. I love you the want idea me to get in my plans, car but... and go somewhere? Huh? Yeah. yeah. No, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But have a great time. I'm sending yeah. you all kinds of happy thoughts. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you are, so you're in your twenties. You are, have discovered alcohol. You are 
exercising six to eight hours a, a day. And are you still, and I'm imagining, are you still dancing or did dancing kind of go side, go? No, I'll tell you what happened with that. I was dancing. So I danced all the way through to college and I was dancing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on the dance team in college and I fractured my spine. So that ended that. <laughs> wow. Yep. Wow. Yeah. So I just stopped and decided to run marathons instead. And, you know. Normal transition. <laughs> uh, yeah, normal transition. Yeah, I fracture my spine. And so I like stop dancing, but I just go into becoming a marathon runner. Yeah. yeah. That may I don't know that that logic makes sense to the part of me that when I was that age, I would have done something really similar. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. it's just like, no. And, yeah. And, you know, I, I ended up running because that was the one thing that I rehabbed myself with mm -hmm. walking to running. But it was also, I was running away from my problems. I was running away from a feeling <laughs> and which I know we'll get into, but this, um, well, one, it's like, you know, there's this control issue with being an empath is like, mm -hmm. when you don't really know how to work with it, you are either trying to suppress it or control it. And neither of those things work. <laughs> so I was really fortunate. So I had a, Growing up at my parents' house, we had a neighbor and she was older than my parents, but she was like my elder mama. And she was born and raised in Louisiana in like the hoodoo and voodoo world. Her grandmother was like this world-renowned psychic. And so she, her name is Diane. She's now dead. I was um, going to ask you what her yeah. name was and if she was on the other side, because I can kind of, oh, yeah. I can kind of feel her. Yeah. yeah what an she's amazing, amazing human being. Diane yeah. Casper, she's a beautiful soul, but she was also off the chart psychic, like tested by the government and they wanted her to work with the government. But her dad said, absolutely not. So, cause she would have been part of probably MK ultra or something. So she fortunately saw my abilities and mentored me. And fun fact, you'd walk in her house and you'd hear all you see and feel and here and everything, all the spirits in her house, it was hysterical. <laughs> like, you know, there was a guy, George, and he would always stand at the top of the stairs. And anyways, so she was my mentor. And um, when we got together, I was mentioning pre-interview that, you know, when I get with certain people, I have this like really intense connection with them, whether it's a past life connection or some kind of cord connection. And her and I, when I was with her, I would all of a sudden, all my abilities would be open mm -hmm. and I could see things and know things and like, Ooh, what is going on here? So she taught me how to control or work with my empathic abilities because I just, I didn't get it. <laughs> yeah. 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 What a blessing that she was there. It's so sad to me how many of us did not find like that no mentor was there. And especially those of us, um, you know, kind of in the 50 and over category, yeah. because it was a time where there was so much denial of, of the alternative realms. And pretty much like there is a lot of like, oh, it's all in your head, or it's just science fiction, or it's just like, it's just a horror movie on TV. There's no such thing as any of this. I'm so grateful that Diane was there and she also recognized you and took you under her wing. She did. She even told me many years ago, because I was, I had a really bad divorce and that's part of the story. But she told me, she goes, I see you, you're going to get married again. And of course, like when you're going through divorce, you're like never again, but he's sitting behind a desk and he's wearing a badge. Well, sure enough. I'm now engaged and he was. Congratulations. Thank you. He was sitting behind a desk wearing a badge. We laughed about it now because he loved her too. She saw it. I'm like, there's no way I'm not getting married again. <laughs> but here I am. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about, I'm sort of imagining that the MS, well, actually, Let's, I, I'll ask you this. Was the MS a wake up call for you or was it like a warning? Side? Was it, was it a shot across the bow that you ignored completely? Ooh, um, 
both, I guess. Uh huh. So at that time, uh, like I said, I was getting my master's degree. I was, so I was teaching undergrad classes. I was working in a human performance lab. I was finishing up my degree. I was working out way too many hours a day. Um, I was in an unhealthy relationship. I just, you know, I, I just wasn't really, I appeared healthy. I was not. And um, it was definitely a wake up call for sure, because it, I had to, I had to change something. Um, and the thought of going on medication scared the bejesus out of me. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I initially went on medication, but that didn't last very long because I was just like, no, nah, this is, this is not, this is not right. So, um, getting that diagnosis was definitely a blessing in disguise because I don't know where I'd be if I didn't get that <laughs> six feet underground or still with a, another broken part of my spine. I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Running more marathons and going crazy. Right. <laughs> but, or maybe even, I don't know, still in a really dysfunctional relationship that is not serving you. I mean, without a doubt. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's the thing too. Um, I know I'm like, feel like I'm jumping now, but oh, um, it's we can follow it. This is, cool. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I think that most empaths are also like, we don't just experience, like, I think that the thing about being highly sensitive is that when you are highly sensitive, you are picking up so much more information and so much Mm -hmm. more stuff than the average bear does. And so as a result, it's like, we are looking at a tapestry as opposed to a sketch. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense that you're like, oh, there's this piece and this piece and this piece. But, you know, I think in my experience, empaths generally have the ability to see the bigger picture in a way that sometimes the, you know, people who are not as sensitive, they may not necessarily look at the whole picture. They're, you know, zeroing in on the one thing. At least yeah, that's I think my that's experience. I agree. I think that's our one gift is like we can really pan out and yeah. see like the whole and not just like the logistics of things, but the feelings of the whole yes. thing. And like, does this feel good or does this not feel good? And that's yes. like, you know, now it's a blessing. Um, but <laughs> but when you're in your 20s, it's not a blessing no. necessarily. No, I think my 20s were probably the hardest decade. I really, really struggled. I mean, I hated my 21st birthday. I was Mm. just, I was in such a bad relationship. And um, I think that's where I was heading in the first place. That's part of like, you know, I don't know if it's ADD or neurodivergent or whatever we are, but I, I relate to that very well. Um, I've actually, there's two, I've recorded two podcasts in, in the last season that are about the correlation or the intersection between ADHD and empaths. There's a lot of us who are neurospicy in multiple yeah. ways. I like yeah. that. Neurospicy. Yeah. Um, but I was in this relationship with this guy and it was like a long, it was like almost 10 years. And he was all, he was very, um, I'm just going to use the word very loosely, but very psychic. So he could, if he was angry, lights would turn off. Okay. Now this was like not unusual for me because of all the things I had already experienced in my life. But of course it was unusual because I didn't know anyone else like that. And so his, he was always like angry and then it's just very intense in all Mm -hmm. the emotions. And Mm -hmm. so it affected me because I didn't know I was an empath. And so those emotions just Sometimes they bounced off me and a lot of times I took them on and I had no idea. It was like tailspin all the time, like, woo. And that's when I kind of started running to towards the end of that relationship because I just, I was like leaving, hoping the feelings were just dropping behind me, like, go away, go away. <laughs> like, I don't know what's happening here. I just want to be, feel at peace, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that relationship was also a big wake up call because, I mean, we weren't, he wasn't mentally healthy in the way, you know, he didn't treat himself or other people really well. And so it just wasn't a good relationship to be in. But it was also after understanding what being an empath means, understanding that that is what was attracted me to him was because I thought I could help him on a Mm -hmm. subconscious level. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, we're all helpers. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, and we, 
<laughs> and we also, when we're around people who are in a lot of distress, we feel better when they feel better. And so we want to, especially when we don't know how to sit with our own discomfort, we will really try to make things feel better. And then it sounds to me like he also had a lot of energetic power. So I'm imagining there was that kind of like moth to a flame with him mm -hmm. where, because also, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but like sometimes when you're around somebody who has such a dominant signal like that, it does kind of drown out other people's signals. So it's kind of like your energy or your focus kind of ends up being on that person as opposed to. It's, it's just kind of like, it's like, it's so loud. <laughs> That's all you can pay attention to for a little while. I I'm never also, thought about that, but yeah. I'm also thinking that it makes complete sense to me that you would have chosen, um, you know, running because it's such a somatic experience. It's so embodied and so much of like getting into the body and being able to be in your body and feeling your body as opposed to all of the emotions, but especially when your head is processing the emotions as opposed to your heart, mm -hmm. it strikes me that, well, of course you would have been drawn to a physical thing that allowed you to process information on a physical level as opposed to trying to process it through your head. Right. So that makes yeah. sense to me, a, lot, a great deal of sense. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> so... I have a, I had a grandfather, my dad's dad, mm -hmm. who I had this experience when I was eight years old. So he was alive. It was summer. I still remember my swimsuit. I think probably every girl at that age had it. It was like a rainbow stripe down a one piece suit and like it was blue or purple. Do you remember that? Um, yeah, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so this is very, I'm a very visual person. Yes. So my my mom and dad and his parents are sitting at the picnic bench and I decide there, we just had lunch and I decide I'm going to go jump in the pool and just go swim. Mm -hmm. And I, oh, I remember this so, so intensely. It's, like, it's still like I had to work through this, but I remember that I was in the pool and my grandfather got up from the picnic table, took off his towel, swim towel. And he's going to jump in the pool. And I remember the look he gave me. And my the hackles on the back of my neck went up. I almost froze. He dove in. And he had his eyes open under the water. And I had never been more terrified. And I could feel, I could feel everything he was thinking. And so I got out of the pool right away. I put his towel on. My mom's like, are you okay? She must have saw my face. But, you know. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> and again, didn't like to talk. That was the end of that. So when my um, grandfather died, it came out that he was a pedophile mm -hmm. to his two daughters and my cousin. And uh, he was not a good person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, what ended up happening was he died when I was about 19 or 20. And I didn't realize until many years later that it, when I synced up all the incidences, I realized he was haunting me. And it was interesting because it didn't matter where I moved to, where I was, what I was doing. If I had even thought his name, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it got cold, it mm. got heavy, and I felt depressed and angry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Different degrees, but it was an immediate, it was like a black cloud was over my head. And as the years went on, it got more and more and more and more mm. until, so I ended up meeting, uh, who is now my ex. So I'm a firefighter and he's a cop and we both work for the city of Chicago. So we met kind of because of work and, um, we ended up getting married and our marriage was not doing well after about six years. And I, for some reason, decided to go to a psychic. And I was in my 30s. I went because I, I don't even know why I went to the psychic, to be honest with you. But I just went. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I had nothing else to do on a Saturday. <laughs> you were guided. 
Probably. I was, I was, yeah. I was definitely guided. And was and Diane so, alive at that point in time or had she crossed She over? was. Yeah, she was alive. Um, nobody else in the room. I went, I think, to ask about my health or something. I, you know, just the gen- generic questions. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. the room went to about 40 degrees. The tablecloth on the table whipped up. And all of a sudden, the psychics are freaking out and she's yelling. Um, because she said right before that happened, she was, I have to ask you a question. I said, okay. She was, it's personal. Okay. Did he, did your grandfather sexually abuse you? I said, I don't think so. She goes, he's telling me he did. And he's laughing about it. You were about one years old. Oh, I'm getting chills. Oh, yeah. So I am that's getting chills when, through my whole body. What yeah, a was, jerk. So he actually was choking me to the point I was not breathing. And of course the psychic's freaking out. She goes and gets sage. It pisses him off more. (laughs) So she's yelling at him. He's sitting on her. He's doing all kinds of stuff in the room. It was horrible. This poor Mm. woman, she's crying. She's crying. I felt Mm. so bad. She probably closed up shop from then on out. I don't know. So fast forward now, um, got married. Marriage wasn't going well. Went to another psychic about six years into marriage and Again, I went for marriage to ask about my marriage and he shows up again. Now, I didn't even mention him, but both of us were, it was, our jaws were hurting, our chest was hurting. And she's like, "Um, I know you want to ask questions about your marriage, but uh, your grandfather is here. I'm like, oh, son of a bitch. (laughs) No, are you kidding me? Again? (laughs) Again. And she said that basically... He got me and my ex together so that I would suffer and be miserable and, uh, you know, basically suck it, (laughs) like take this, um, because I was the most sensitive in the family, shocking. And so he wanted me to suffer just because, just because, just because. So she ended up doing this like African voodoo chant that she's like, don't ever repeat this, which I couldn't if I wanted to, because it was Mm -hmm. like, God, God. You know, like, I don't know what you're even saying, <laughs> but, um, and literally the room started to smell like roses. She actually called me the next day. So now I can say his name and nothing ever happens, but my mm-hmm. mom does not like mentioning his name ever. But then fast And is he the one who's responsible for your actual name or was that a different grandfather? He's responsible for my name. Yes. Yeah, so I will tell you, so now this is where it gets interesting. I did a QHHT session. So for your listeners, what does QHHT stand for? Okay. Quantum healing hypnosis technique. Ah, So yes, uh, Dolores Cannon. So Mm -hmm, I'm sure mm -hmm. everyone's familiar with Dolores Cannon. She's amazing. So I had this session and uh, I had low back pain. So I fractured my spine and I had all kinds of other low back issues that can never be resolved. (sighs) I had this session and come to find out, and this is going to get really out there, but for your listeners, I think we can handle it. Yeah. uh, a lifetime over 20,000 years ago on another planet that I don't even know if it exists anymore. Um, we were reptilians. And mm-hmm. so me and six other people, one of them being my grandfather, he wasn't my grandfather at the time, but the same energy, the same mm-hmm. spirit. Mm-hmm. We were all in charge of this planet. And I mean, we were uh, upright reptilians and mm-hmm. Uh, they wanted to enslave all the people. And I was the only one that said, absolutely not. We're not enslaving people. This is not a prison planet. And for some reason, the uh, the body that was my grandfather's energy took it very personally. And so he sent me to a prison planet. That's actually a planet where they put used to put all different beings from different planets on there and you just die there alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in doing so, he attached a cord to me for every mm. lifetime after. Every single lifetime after that one, because he wanted to punish me in every single lifetime. So I had to get this cord removed and it was really thick. And it hurt, like it physically hurt me, my in present body time yeah. coming out. And they said, give it three days and you'll be fine. And sure enough, three days, I'm fine. Mm. I had problems my whole entire life. So this energy and being an empath really created this, this cyclone of 
sucking me into what I really wasn't put here to do. But he was such a, I should have mentioned too, when the second psychic removed him from me, she said that he was like a, a serpent. Mm-hmm. And he was going away from, he was banished for good. Or I don't know what that means exactly, but gone for good. So, you know, I wasn't put here for this. And I think when my soul came in, I had a different plan, but he had found his cord to me and made half of my life hell. So I had to have this all absolved so that I can really do my thing. And everything kind of just cleared up after that. Every All the debris moved out of my way. And then being an empath after that was like, oh, I get it now. I get it. <laughs> like, okay, this is not so horrible. So every all the pieces started to fall into place. But when you're an empath and you're being attacked um, psychically or energetically, and you don't even know, those energies, those, that emotion is so intense that yes. you don't even know what to do with it. And I feel like sometimes people who are diagnosed with like schizophrenia or bipolar, that's really what's happening. Mm-hmm. And so I think people really need to understand that being an empath is, it can be great, it can be an ally, but it can also be very detrimental if you don't have the right tools. Absolutely. Yes. And I do think, you know, there's, while empath is not a diagnostic term, it's not in the DSM-5 or anything, I do think that there are so many things that are diagnosable that that could easily be seen as, oh, that's because this person is picking up so much more than other people are. And I mean, we live in a culture that's constantly telling people you're being too sensitive, you're overreacting, it's your problem, you're broken. So, you know, I hear you. I've seen enough correlation between being highly sensitive and what is considered a mental health issue that I think that there's a real strong connection there. I had this image as you were talking about your grandfather or this soul that you have been sort of like, you know, you guys have been kind of in this cosmic battle for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And I had this image when you were talking about somehow he found you and I was like, oh, he found, he had like, the sense I got was like, he literally used the cord that he had to you to pull your soul into his family system and like pull your soul into like his DNA so that his daughter was able to give birth to you. Like, I just get the sense of like, he pulled you into this family system. And that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. But because, you know, and, and just like that, he was doing this, what a jerk. Like, it feels like he, it, it feels like I just keep sensing like a massive amount of narcissistic personality disorder on this guy, like just a, a classic narcissist too. Just everything is about him. And I married a narcissist. So of course you did. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I think like most of us do, you know, yeah, because <laughs> we want to fix people. Right. But, yeah. Well, and the empath narcissist combo is such a, it's such a fascinating dynamic, but it, it seems like it is a very common one. And my personal theory is also that at the beginning, there is nothing more delicious than the combination of the empath and the narcissist, because both of them are just like getting high on the adulation that the narcissist uh, is both receiving and giving because they, you know, the narcissist just like drinks up all of the loving attention from the empath. And then the empath feels all of that and just like is basking in the glow of that. And everybody's happy for a while until life changes, but (laughs) yeah. Yeah. So, um, what a miracle and what a blessing that you were able to find support and just really completely eliminate that cord from your grandfather or from the soul. It feels like grandfather doesn't even feel like an accurate, like he's your, your nemesis, you know? Yeah. Like, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> it's a, it was a very dark energy. And so, you know, that incident with the pool, it all made sense when I understood that it's almost like once in a while he was taken over by his soul energy and yes. not his logical mind. Mm-hmm. And when I saw his eyes in that pool incident, it was like almost like my soul had a remembering of who he really is and who yeah. I really am and how our, we're connected. Although I 
you know, of course, all hindsight, I would never have figured that out at eight years old. But uh, it's just that, you know, that well, knowing. Is, assuming what he told that psychic about molesting you at one, your body also remembered what a dangerous person he was. And probably you were having, I'm imagining you were having like your body was just like danger. Will Robinson, let's get the hell out of here. This Absolutely. is not a good thing. Yeah. 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 And then I, I did actually remember the sexual trauma incident. So I had to process that out, but mm. at least I, at least I got to process it out. Um, even though I was one, we still have memory. And Absolutely. Well, there, and our so. body still carries the memory. It's we, I mean, I think we, our body carries memories even in utero. Like it's, it's not like if you can't intellectually remember something, it didn't happen. It still happens. It still yeah. happened. It's still recorded yeah. in energy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So did the, um, Quantum healing and the work that you did, it sounds like as you were saying that the back pain lifted, like that went away. What about the MS? Was that something that really shifted as you started to do, to like to really do the healing work? Did did you find that you got a lot of relief? I mean, obviously you're a firefighter at this point in time. That's not exactly a career that I'd imagine for people with MS. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> they actually wanted me to go on disability, but no. Yeah. So the, the quantum healing and the inner child shadow work, all of that really started to help me heal on my path. And once I, once I had my grandfather out of the way, it literally, I was able to shift into healing mode because before I was just in survival and I didn't even know, you know, like yeah, you were you in a burning are, building. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You and I are in the generation of like, we didn't really have the resources. There wasn't no. the information out there. There wasn't the internet to go search things up or, you know, find no. all this stuff. So you had no. to if you were lucky, there were two shelves in the yes, library yes. <laughs> of like ghosts <laughs> with really bad ghosts or, books yeah. on the yeah. occult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. With the Dewey Decimal System. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you're kind of going blind, you know? Yeah. And, but it's like, Pre-cord removal and post-cord removal. You know, the pre-cord, I was literally in survival. I was just trying to make it through every day. Once that cord was removed and he was removed from my life, I was like, oh my God, my body can finally heal. So there are many layers, but I don't, I haven't taken medication in like 18 years. Um, I take no medication. I deal only with energy, frequency, homeopathics, plant medicine. I, and that's how I treat my kids. We don't, they know we don't do medication. Um, and so, because if your body is out of balance, it's going to let you know. And that's, you know, part of my MS was like, oh, you're, you're just, you're not in balance. Something's off. Yeah. So let's, let's show you why you're off. You know, you're not listening. So here you go. Yeah. And when you understand that, and that all of that comes from emotions and sometimes ancestral crap. Yes. Um, and karmic so, crap. Yep. Karmic yep. crap. That stuff's real. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got story upon story of my Akashic records. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you oh, and I could share quite a few oh. stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So my healing has been fantastic. I mean, it's been a journey. It's a roller coaster ride, you know, but sometimes I just marvel at this human experience like man, it's amazing. You know, it's amazing that I've gotten this far. I've done so much healing. I'm helping other people. I can really, really use my empathic abilities now as a gift only. Yeah. You know, I don't let them hinder me. I don't let them take over my life anymore because, you know, before I didn't know what the day was going to bring. Am I going to be like jilted with emotions that I don't know if they're mine or not? You know, you couldn't, you can't go to large crowds. You can't mm -hmm. go. I couldn't even go to a supermarket when it was crowded because I would, I, it was just too much. I can't do loud noises. I still can't do loud noises. I don't like a lot of noise, but I know what works for me and I know what doesn't work for me. And so now I just use it as a gift and continue to, to work on myself so that I can work, help other people and know that 
you know, healing is not a linear thing and no. it's not a one size fits all, Mm-mm. but everyone's capable of healing. Yeah. You just have to know thyself really well. Yeah. Yeah. The other day I was actually teaching a master class in my Facebook group where we were talking about the distinction between healing and a cure, you know, and just like, I don't know, like just that if that's making sense to you, but just like recognizing like the journey of healing, it's definitely not linear. And sometimes it doesn't show up exactly as we expect it to either. That It's like versus quote cure, which tends to be a lot more linear, but also tends to have sort of like a, you know, an expectation or like, this is it. Like, it's like a cure is like one plus one equals. And always the answer is the same thing, but healing. Exactly. And I feel like, I feel like a cure, you're taking the backseat. You're not yeah. doing the work yourself. No. Which doesn't necessarily mean there's it has to be a lot of work, but healing means that you've honored where you're at. Yes. And you've taken the steering wheel, you've taken over the driving yeah. to help balance yourself back out. Whereas a cure, you're just looking for a fix. <laughs> like mm-hmm. just someone fix me. You know, and like sometimes we need that. Like you break a bone. I can't use plant medicine to no. heal my broken bone or, you know, heal a, a stopped heart or something, you've got to have, you know, your your body has to be functional. But healing means that it covers the whole body and yes. not just one area and that you have control over it. Yes. Yes. That's my definition. <laughs> well, and I think as you were saying, you know, it's like you can't necessarily set a bone. Like if like you got a bone and it's out of place, you need somebody to just adjust it and set it so that it can heal. And one thing that I also have seen is that I think there's also being honest with ourselves about how far far down the scale we have gone, because sometimes something that we could have healed by doing the emotional work earlier, the impact is so like that we get to a certain point where it's almost like the point of no return is going to require a medical intervention because it progressed so drastically. Like, you know, if something, you know, if somebody's, you know, like a ruptured appendix, you can't necessarily pray over once it's ruptured, the story is a little bit different than when it's just inflamed. And I think that there is like, I'm a very strong believer in listen to what your intuition is telling you. If you're being told, go to the emergency room because your heart is something's going wrong with your heart or you have a blockage, then go to the emergency room. And um, because it is not linear and it does, and one size does not fit all. And also, you know, sometimes we do things like push ourselves <laughs> to exercise six to eight hours a day for many, many years. And suddenly our body just goes, Ugh. I'm a very strong believer in how do we listen to ourselves? But what I love you talking about is it's about the willingness, at least this is what I'm taking from what I'm hearing you say, is it's about the willingness to show up for ourselves and be willing to look at and do the work that is presented. Does that yeah. reflect it? Yeah. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And I'm glad you said, you know, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I was, I was saying how sometimes like, you, you know, depending on how far down the road you've gone, yes, you may need that. intervention. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad you said that. Cause there, there is like, like you said, there's a point of no return. If we don't have a viable body, Working on healing your emotions to heal your physical body, there's no point because we right. don't have a viable body. So right. yeah, there's definitely a point of no return. It doesn't mean you shouldn't still work on your emotional body, but you do have to take appropriate steps. You know, if you're having serious heart pain or chest pain, like you said, go to the ER. Don't pray over it and <laughs> because you don't you can't see what's going on inside. You're not an x-ray machine. No, Maybe no, you're no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> so, well, know, and there's some bleeding. things where we can't read the label from the inside of the jar. And also where we just need help. Like, I mean, the story of just working with those, it seems to me that it was the psychics that made it possible, like gave you the tools. Like you were trapped in a building Like, I just have this image of like, you were trapped in a building or you were trapped in a cave with a whole bunch of stones, like in front of it. And somebody needed to like roll the stone back in order for you to have the freedom to then do the healing work. But as long as your grand, your nemesis, 
had you locked in this cave or locked in this cage, it was like you needed to ask for help, like, and you did. And that's where I think your agency and your advocacy came in was because you were the one who said, I need help. Yes, please. Unlo- you know, like I'm trapped in this cage. Would you please turn the key? Sounds very accurate. Yes, it's a good analogy. Yeah, it's like if the cave opening is completely blocked from light, you don't even know that there's an opening. So right. if someone, one person can just remove one stone so I can see some light, then, you know, I can start to help myself. Then I can ask for more help. And then, so it's not that you have to do all the work alone because, you know, I had my mentor. Um, she worked with me a lot yeah. <laughs> because I was stubborn and I didn't get it. Um, and well, I mean, there's a certain, there's a certain bit of like, we think we're so wise and old and jaded in our like 20s, 30s. And sometimes, you know, like oh. even more 20s and 30s than early 40s. I think by the time we get to our 40s, we start get to getting a little humbled and mm-hmm. a little and getting some perspective. But especially your 20s and 30s, it's like we, yeah. we don't know what we don't know. No, I wouldn't yeah. go back to my 20s either. That was just that was really yeah. up that day. Yeah. No, thanks. No, thanks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so. Samaya, I cannot believe how fast the time has gone. Everybody who listens to the show knows that I always say this at a certain point, and I always mean it. I really do. (laughs) This has just been such an incredible conversation, and I want to be sure we have enough time for a couple, you know, a couple more questions. And so I want to just ask you, what is like, is there anything that just feels like I absolutely want to be sure that I share this piece of information? Yes. Um, this is what feels right at this moment. You could ask me tomorrow, I might change my mind. But um, for a long time, because of being an empath and not sure whose feelings I was feeling, and then so much intensity of the feelings, a lot of times, it, you know, you numb out the feelings. And I think that that's a huge disservice because for my experience, I was very much in a masculine role for a lot of things and still am. And then what happens is you forget about your feminine side and there has to be a balance. You have to have both. And I was so in the masculine that, I mean, it's toxic. And I came across as cold or uncaring or, you know, or a go-getter. Um, I, I could get a lot accomplished. I was, you know, well accomplished but that did me a disservice. And then I also forgot about my feelings, my emotions and ignoring those, not allowing yourself to feel is how you get sick. Yes. It causes any and every disease you can think of. So again, not giving yourself the space to feel will cause disease down the road. It just continues to pile Preach. on. Preach, <laughs> preach, preach, preach. Well, and in my experience, also ignoring when you are feeling when something's coming up and it's it's really, really hard and you keep on sort of like, you know, the writing is on the wall, you know, no, no, that something, a change is coming and you just keep on trying to double down or lean even further into the thing <laughs> that is not serving you. And my personal experience is that you know, the universe kind of has like a series of ways of kind of like being like, hey, you're really sure you want to be doing this? And usually it starts with like locking my keys in my car or locking myself out of something or running out of gas or having some kind of minor inconvenience. Next thing it tends to do, or when I was younger as it would, next thing would be a car accident. Thankfully, that has Mm -hmm. stopped being the modus operandi of the universe with me. But then there would be an inevitable point where if I did not listen my body would, I would either have an, you know, something that would happen where I would be kind of brought to my knees or, you know, just like knocked on my butt, sometimes literally, but that my health would be the emergency break, that my health would be the thing that would just kind of be like, oh, you're not going to stop? Fine, we're going to stop you now. And that's, absolutely been my experience. So I'm really loving how you are saying, like, if you don't create the space to feel your feelings, and I would say to acknowledge the truth of what you're being told, then it's sort of like your body is going to do it for you. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and sometimes we don't know if it's 
the, you know, our ego or really our spirit. Um, and so, you know, understanding your intuition and dropping in and like, is this mine? Is this not mine? You don't have to feel everybody's feelings, but you do have to feel your own. Oh my God. What an amazing <laughs> quote. You don't have to feel everybody else's feelings, but you do have to feel your own. Right. Otherwise. <laughs> But so you said like, oh, the minor inconvenience to the car accident to this. So I say it's like the universe kind of like taps on your door, right? It's like the warning. If you're, And then if you don't pay attention to the tapping on the door, they start pounding on the door. Mm-hmm. And then if you don't listen to the pounding on the door, they bust your door down. And that's when you're in trouble. So I'm telling you, if you do not pay attention to your emotions and allow them to process out your health will eventually suffer. And that's actually proven in quantum mechanics. I won't get into that now because that's like a 15 minute conversation. Yeah. (laughs) Quantum quantum physics shows Mm -hmm. that that's actually, you know, the the wave of possibilities here and it translates into your physical body. So Mm -hmm. whatever you Mm -hmm. choose consciously, subconsciously becomes your physical body. So if you have a resource about this or a video or anything that you've recorded before, we can certainly include it in the show notes as well. Sure. So that, yeah, yeah, we can let people know. Awesome. So we are coming to that point where I um, I get to ask the question that I love to ask because I believe that podcasts are unique in the sense that there are broadcasts that exist in perpetuity. There are broadcasts that, you know, people, we're recording this now in, I mean, this is being recorded before it's going to air. And so we're recording it in spring of 2023. But, you know, people are going to be listening to this, you know, 10, hopefully even 20 years later, maybe even longer. But I also believe that these podcasts not only broadcast forward in the future, but there's It's a way that the signal goes back. And I really like to think of it as like this conversation is like, um, it's like a ribbon in the timeline and we can fold it on top of itself and we can go back in time and talk to the younger, the younger Tracy and we can give her a message. And so I always love to imagine we are time traveling back to a moment when Tracy really, really needed your love and your guidance. So when are we going back to and what are you telling her? Probably to the about the age of eight or seven or eight when I That's what I was seeing was the eight year old. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) When I was just so awkward and it's you know, I felt like the black sheep in the family, like most of us do. And um just to know that, you know, you will find your people, you'll find your tribe. You're not the only one like this love yourself first and then people will love you so that you can love them back but just love yourself first honor who you are it'll all be it'll all be good (laughs) Tracy this has been such an incredibly wonderful rich and satisfying conversation I just thank you so much first off thank you so much for being so real for being so vulnerable and just sharing your story so truthfully it really was such a this has been such an incredible gift so my final question for you is how can people get in touch with you sure so my um, website where you can sign up for my emails is consciousevolution.coach and my facebook is consciousevolution.coach i also have tiktok that's conscious evolution <laughs> coach um i sense a sense i i sense a pattern here a little bit yeah just a little bit <laughs> a small pattern yeah um, but also if you or anyone you know has ms um mm-hmm. i have a facebook group private facebook group called healing multiple sclerosis naturally with over twenty two thousand people in there so it's a it's a big private group but it's a private group <laughs> so you're more than welcome to hop in there too Awesome. Awesome. I actually do know of somebody who might be interested. So yeah, amazing. And we will include all of this in the show notes. So if you guys are listening and you're like driving along or something and you don't have the ability to just jump over to the website immediately, come on over to empathicmasteryshow.com where you can find this episode and you can find all the links to all the things that will bring you into Tracy, a.k.a. Samaya's world. 
What a rich conversation. Thank you so much for being here today. And thank you so much for your time and your candor and just, and all of your light. Thank you, Jennifer. I love you. And your show is beautiful. Thank you. As we come to the end of this episode, I'd love to hear what you're taking from this show. Please jump over to empathicmasteryshow.com to leave your comments. In the show notes, you'll find a link to grab your copy of My Empathic Safety Guide, Three Basics for Finding Calm in the Eye of the Storm. And while you're there, please subscribe and follow this show. And thank you for your help sharing this show with the people who need it. Please help me to spread the word and send this podcast to friends or family members who need support living as highly sensitive empathic people. Then join me again when the next Empathic Mastery Show airs. Okay, one last time, hop over to EmpathicMasteryShow.com for your empathic safety guide. And until next show, shine on. We need you and your gifts here on this planet. So please don't judge your empathic rainbow by colorblind standards.